Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Um, well, thank you all for uh, coming today. Uh, my name is Paul Thomas. Um, we'll be talking today about some uh, latency benchmarking of the Cortex um, A53 uh, processor from ARM. Um, so uh, I'm from AMSC. We're head, uh, founded in uh, 1987, um, headquartered um, near Boston, Massachusetts, in, in Air, Massachusetts. Um, and we specialize in the design and manufacture of power systems and superconducting wire. Um, I don't get too involved in the superconducting wire part, but it's, uh, it is very uh, fascinating. Um, as we go along, um, if you guys have questions, I know it's hard with the microphones, but feel free to uh, raise your hand and interrupt, and I'll try to um, repeat the question or get you a microphone quick. Um, I would rather, uh, if you have a question, I'm sure other people have questions, and so just, just raise your hand, interrupt, and we'll um, talk about something for, for longer. So feel free to do that. Okay. Um, so today, we'll, I'll go through the software and hardware setup for these benchmarks. Um, then we'll go through some of the basic uh, latency tests using the cyclic test tool. It's a common, a common tool um, to just test uh, the standard latency, but it doesn't have, um, it doesn't have any external interrupts, and then we'll We'll look at some uh, a ping pong latency test between um, two separate boards um, going back and forth. Um, and then finally, we'll look at a real world um, ADC uh, interrupt latency. Actually, a, it's an AD, a analog to digital converter, but um, ultimately the interrupt is a um, DMA complete interrupt. So we'll take a, bit, a look at that um, later on. Okay. So, why real-time Linux? Um, stable and supported code base, we, we all know that, that's why, that's why we're here. Um, uh, deep APIs, so oftentimes you're in the real-time context, you're kind of trading off between the, the breadth and depth of the APIs and the performance of the real-time. And with preempt RT, um, you, you still have good latency performance, but you have all the, the Linux APIs that we know and love just within one, one system. The, um, I think some of you will be at the, the real-time summit on Thursday. Um, we'll get an update um, on the real-time Linux collaboration project, which um, ultimately aims to um, mainline the, the preempt RT. I'm not uh, involved in that, but um, looking at the, the performance of, of that. Um. Okay, so the Cortex A53, um, why, why is that an important part? Um, we're um, interested in it because the uh, Zinc um, Ultra Scale Plus parts um, use that. ARM core. Um, it's a 64-bit um, ARM core, ARM V8. Um, and then there's lots of other parts um, that are based on this, including the Raspberry Pi, uh, the Model 3. Um, the, I just listed a couple on here. The, um, I guess it's NXP now. It used to be Freescale. has the IMX8 and the Odroid um, C2. It's a very common um, ARM V8 core in the um, embedded, embedded marketplace. You're probably not going to see too many um, Cortex uh, A53s in your phones uh, these days. But maybe a few of the older phones would, would have them on there. Um, okay. So the hardware setup. So this is comparing um, kind of two different boards. 
Um, one based on the arm cortex A9 and the other based on the arm cortex A53. The actual module um, we're looking at is the Enclustra um, Mercury uh, XU5 module. Um, it's based on that Xilinx um, SOC. Uh, it's an eight stage pipeline, 1.3 gigahertz clock speed. Um, contrasted with the Cortex A9, it's several years older. Um, the board for that test is the, the Z board um, from, from uh, Avnet and others. The, and that's the original, uh, that's the core used in the original zinc parts from Xilinx. So this is kind of the evolution of the Xilinx parts, and so it's kind of interesting to look at the, the performance there. One thing to note, when we get to the UDP ping pong test, um, the Z board um, does not have a uh, second ethernet port, and so those tests were, um, the, the second ethernet port could not be, um, because it wasn't there, it was just shared with the same ethernet port that was used for SSH and the, the rest of the system. And so it had other traffic on it besides the, um, the, UDP, the UDP traffic. Um, and the, it's, so it's a 10, 10 plus stage pipeline and 666 megahertz. So you, you, you can see just from the specs that the, the Cortex A53 should be a, a much higher performance part. Um, okay. The kernel. So the starting point uh, for both of these was uh, 4.18. Um, so it had the preempt, the preempt RT patch came out shortly after that, and so it was the very first one that um, RT1 patch applied. You can see the, the URL there. And then for the, the Zinc, the Zinc MP, that also had um, this firmware and clock driver patch applied. Um, this is, so Xilinx is actively trying to get all the new features upstreamed, and this, and some of those features, you know, are just needed to run, and so we had to pull, I had to pull off a, um, that patch, and then beyond that, there were, um, there were a few more hurdles to get through to get the, the latest kernel to run on the, the Zinc MP, the, uh, um, you had to have the, the lower level firmware, so the first stage bootloader and um, the PMU firmware and the ARM trusted firmware all had to be up to date. And so there was a, was a little bit of uh, work getting that all up to date and then a, a, a few more things that um, um, the Xilinx guys helped with a little bit. Um, but that should all be as the Patches are mainlined, then future versions um, should be, and as the, the standard, the regular um, software releases from Xilinx come in, the, um, that should be a, a, a seamless process in, in the future. Okay, so here's the first, the first result. So this is the basic cyclic test results. So this, um, you can see the, the Cortex A9 had a, a maximum latency of um, uh, 54 microseconds, and the Cortex A53 had a maximum latency of um, 17 microseconds. Normally in the uh, real-time latency testing, we're just concerned with the maximum. Um, I did put the, the mode on here just as a kind of a point of reference for the, the peak on the, um, yeah, so you can see, I put the mode on there just so you can see kind of where those peaks are. So those peaks are coming in at 19 and seven microseconds respectively. Um, this, this is um, similar, this 54 microseconds is very similar to a kernel I ran several years ago um, um, for the, the Cortex-A9, but these are both with the 4.18. Kernel, um, and you can see there, it's, you know, about three times, the, the Cortex-A53 is about three times 
three times faster. Or, yeah. Um, so let's see. So let's talk about the setup a little bit. Um, so for the setup, uh, CPU sets um, were used, so that's a, a way to shield um, specific cores. And so the kernel portion of that is CPU sets. The um, user space management is via um, CPU, CPU set, and that's a Python um, application. So it's an effective way to shield one or more cores from scheduling ordinary tasks. So this is, so if you have a real-time system, you know, the system has to do all of its normal things. You know, it has to have its uh, SSH server. It has to, um, you know, do all of its housekeeping stuff for the system. But then if you want to run real-time tasks as well, you may want to dedicate uh, kind of one or more cores for that and to, to ensure that the scheduler isn't, you know, scheduling other things on those cores, you can use these. CPU sets. Um, okay. So here's the test configuration. So the we basically uh, set up in a shielded way. So CPU three um, was the user set, and then the, the CPU zero, one, and two were the system set. Um, the, for the Cortex A9, it's only a dual core, so the system set was was just one core, so um, you know, just one less there. And then, so the actual loading, so the system set had um, cyclic test with a priority of 98 running, um, and cyclic test with a priority of 99, and then a stress program, and the stress um, it had eight uh, CPU hogs and eight uh, virtual memory um, threads. And so those are trying to kind of be memory intensive and CPU intensive stress. The, the user set, um, you could set this up different ways depending on what the real world load was. In this case, I only gave it a loading of a lower priority cyclic test. So, um, so it had a cyclic test priority of 98, and then, and then the actual test itself, which was, you know, the... So the results, the results from the graph are the cyclic test with a priority of 99 on the shielded CPU core. Yeah, and you can see the actual stress command there. Let's see. Okay. Then the UDP uh, ping pong test. So this setup was, um, so here you can see, so this was run two different ways. This was one run from the Cortex A53 to the uh, to another Cortex A53, and that's the setup you see here, and you can see this Ethernet cable here that connects them. That was actually a, a separate Ethernet port from where all the SSH traffic was, um, and it, so it only had the, the UDP traffic of this ping pong test on it, and um, so yeah, this is from the same board, from the Cortex A53. For the, the Z board, I, I, I don't show that setup here, but it's just with a single um, Ethernet cable. Um, I ended up not using the CPU sets um, because it was affecting the performance a little bit. That, that's something that's um, worth investigating. I wonder if I had certain thread, I wonder if there were K threads from the networking that were affecting how the, the isolation was working. So I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but um, I pulled off the, the CPU set stuff, but the, um, but the loading, the stress loading and the cyclic test loading was all still the same. So it all had a, um, it was, the processors were loaded 
and there was a cyclic test running with a priority of um, 97 in this case because the, the IRQ, so the Ethernet IRQ was given a priority of 99. The, the thread or the processes were given a priority of 98, and then the, the cyclic test loading, just for background loading, was given a priority of 97. So you can see the performance here. The, the Cortex A53 is um, still reasonably fast. So the, that 168, um, if you want to think of the one-way path, um, you probably think of half of that, 80, 84. Um, I didn't put it in, I put it in round trip just because when you're considering the, the, the blue one here, that has, it's one half of the Cortex A53 and one half of the Cortex A9, so it's not, it's not really half of that. It's, um, you, could, you could break it up like that, but I, ju I just left it as the raw uh, full round trip for both tests. And so this, this is quite a bit longer than the cyclic test, so it, um, for the maximum of, you know, kind of 84 there, um, but it's still very, very respectable. The, the Cortex-A9, you can see it, it kind of has these stragglers, and um, I, didn't, I didn't really have time to investigate what the, what the cause of that was. Um, so th these go out above 800 microseconds. Um, 800 microseconds was just the largest bin I, I did for the, um, for the latency capture. And so I wonder if there isn't... Um, I wonder if there isn't something going wrong to have, to have that continually uh, go out really high. So that, that could be investigated, because um, certainly the, the cyclic test performance by themselves, even though it was higher than the A53, it was still bound. You could kind of still see the, the clear maximum um, at the top there. Yeah, 800 microseconds was the largest bin. Um, okay. So a real world test. So this is almost a real world test. So um, I'm show you the setup in a minute here, but basically an analog to digital driver. Um, using the industrial IO subsystem of the kernel, um, I think there's a talk later today um, from the maintainer of that. Um, so uh, check that out if you're interested in the industrial I.O. subsystem. Um, this is the, the test here is DMA engine based and then the, the for performance is captured uh, using a hardware timer. So I'll kind of go into how we actually capture the latency performance um, in a minute. It's a little bit um, tricky. So just a quick blurb on industrial I.O. Um, I, 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 how, how many people have used um, industrial I.O. In the, in the kernel? Okay, so maybe a third or so, a quarter. Um, it's an extremely useful subsystem. Um, you, can, you can get, um, there's many pre-existing drivers for uh, analog to digital converters um, or digital to analog converters, accelerometers, um, a whole, a whole slew of different um, devices. Um, it can provide uh, text formatted measurements. You know, you just cat a sys file and you can see the measurement. Or you can kind of do a, there's a ring buffered um, version where you can actually read in the raw data, um, you know, from a, from a C program. You don't, you don't if, you're, if you're dealing with a lot of data, you don't really want to go, you know, to a text stream and then back to a, um, back to a, an integer or float. Um, yep. Okay, so here's this test setup. So in the, the, the Zinc MP um, parts, or the MP SOC parts, they have both a programmable logic, so they have an FPGA portion, and they have the processing system. So you have, you have both of these pieces, and the programmable logic, you can do all sorts of things with it, um, but one thing you can do with it is you can kind of decouple 
kind of uh, very fast, uh, low-level housekeeping of, in this case, uh, an SPI bus, or actually a whole, whole bunch of SPI buses. And so you have a, um, in, th in this setup, I, I didn't have um, external hardware, so I was just using kind of a simulated hardware in the programmable logic. So you have a, you have a simulated uh, A to D converter, um, and then that's through SPI connected to this uh, controller, the A to D controller. The A to D controller has a SPI, it kind of spits out a AXI stream, um, and that AXI stream um, connects straight to the, the DMA block. The DMA block, so this DMA block has a corresponding uh, DMA engine driver in the Linux kernel. So Xilinx has a, a DMA engine driver um, that can, can directly connect to this DMA block that's in the programmable logic. Um, yeah, it's, it's, this path isn't really important, but it's, um, oh, no, no, that is the main data path. Um, it actually is also has a configuration, um, it has a configuration section that's not, not shown here. And so when that interrupt, so when the DMA is complete, there's an interrupt that goes to the, process, the processing system. And so I just parallel that signal into a timer capture block. So the, and so this, this timer capture block, um, it has a free running timer, and then when, the, when it sees that interrupt uh, rising edge, it just kind of saves off that free running timer for future use, and so that's, I'll go into that more um, in the next few slides, but that's kind of how you can use the, the hardware block to capture the latency of an external. Um, e even though this is all within the chip, this is kind of, this is all external to Linux. Linux doesn't really know anything about programmable logic, so that's all kind of external system. Okay, so then, what, what's the latency there? So the, the maximum latency was 30 microseconds. Um, so not quite as good as the cyclic test, um, one of, uh, was it seven, 17? microseconds or down in that range, um, but still, still, still very good. Um, let me, I think, yeah, so let me go into some more detail on that um, timer capture function. Yeah, so hardware timers um, with a capture function are common in SOCs and microcontrollers. I'm sure many of you have used you know, oftentimes timers will be used for like a PWM output, um, but many times the same timer block in a microcontroller also can be used for this capture function. So to very accurately, um, essentially time stamping an external event. So upon, upon the trigger event, the present value of the free running timer is stored in the load register. So all, and all the different uh, microcontroller vendors, they all, you know, all the peripherals are implemented a tiny bit different, and so, um, you know, just you have to look at the how, how your specific timer um, is implemented, and then you can kind of um, use it to do uh, similar functions like this. So in the, so then in the kernel ISR, so the, the DMA engine has a callback. So in the IIO driver, the industrial IO driver, um, when you set up the DMA, you register the callback. So the latency that we're measuring is from when the hardware interrupt happened to when we're actually um, in the DMA callback within the IIO driver. So all the DMA stuff um, before that callback has already been taken care of. So you could, you could push it upstream a little bit and try to get the latency kind of when it fir very first um, enters the kernel. But this, this test was for um, when you're in the, the callback in the driver. Is there, is, is there any questions on how that, uh, um, how that hardware capture works? Okay. OK. 
Okay. Um, conclusions. So the Cortex A53 is a very low latency, low latency core. Um, using the programmable logic to decouple the SPI bus is very effective. So oftentimes when you have an A to D converter like this, you would have several different things going on. Normally you would, you can still do a, uh, a DMA transfer and you can, you, the, the work that the kernel is doing is still relatively minimal. But oftentimes what you have is if you have an external um, analog to digital converter chip, it'll have a, a signal that says the conversion's done. And so you, you could easily just use that conversion done signal, you know, you get that interrupt within the, you know, say you're using the, the IIO driver, you get that interrupt within the IIO driver, and then you say, okay, the, the conversion's done, go grab, go grab the transfer. And so then you, um, you issue the DMA command I, I mean, in, in for the SPI bus or some other buses, you can still use the DMA. And then when that DMA is ultimately finished, you can um, get that interrupt within the driver and actually, you know, push, it, push the data to the ring buffers. But you're dealing with at least two interrupts there when wh what, what you really want is um, you, you just want the single interrupt when everything's all transferred. And so you can... You can parallel um, a whole bunch of different um, converters and you can have the programmable logic deal with all the low level stuff. And then you can just let Linux, um, you kind of notify Linux when everything's done and transferred to memory. Um, and it's very effective to, to have minimal latencies uh, doing that. Um, future work. So investigate the UDP path latencies. So those, those seem very high, and I, I'm guessing that is a lot to do with how much processing the, the TCP IP stack within the kernel is doing. Um, and so there, maybe there's um, ways that we can either bypass that stack or speed up that stack um, I think we heard Jonathan talk about the AF uh, XDP on Monday. Um, so that's one option. Um, yeah, and investigate the difference between the cyclic tests and ADC driver results. So that we did see a little bit of a maximum. So those are, um, you know, slightly different interrupt paths, but they had um, different maximum times, so it might be interesting to kind of dig a little deeper there and see what's, what's causing those differences. Um, track uh, preempt RT ac across kernel versions. So this is only um, one snapshot in time, and so I think it, it would be interesting for you know, a specific setup to kind of track that as the, the kernel versions move along. Let's see. Um, so just a uh, quick thanks. Um, uh, Rajan Baja from Xilinx, uh, he helped us get up and running with the 418 kernel. Um, uh, the boards from Inclustra, and then uh, I want to thank my wife and family. So that's, uh, that's all I have. <laughs> So are there uh, questions? Let me get this mic. Yeah. Um, so I've been working with a mainline kernel uh, for your uh, test. So can you recommend now using mainline for Sync Ultra K Plus MPC SOC? Because I'm always struggling. Once in a while I try the mainline but then I go back to the Xilinx uh, tree, which I really don't like. So yeah. you seem to be successful. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was successful getting the 418 kernel to work. Um, it, was, it was a little bit painful um, at times. And so I think without, without that extra help, um, I'm not 
sure um, I would have gotten there. Um, I, they, are, they are actively incorporating those patches. So the biggest one is that clock and firmware one. Um, so I haven't checked in the last uh, week or two. Um, and so once that gets incorporated into the main line, that's the biggest one. And then the other, the other big thing is that all the low level um, firmware pieces um, get um, up to date. So all, I think in Xilinx world, like 2018 too, everything has to be up to 2018 too um, to run. I would be really interested to build that like you. So I, 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 can, I can provide, um, if, if you sh email me, I can provide you the kernel I'm using. It, it's v besides those two patches, the modifications are very subtle. There, there's not much going on. So, but, but, but if, if there's still a gap in time, if there's, you know, the next three or six months when it's helpful to have um, that specific kernel out there, I can, I can uh, provide it to you or push it to GitHub or something. Okay, that's cool. Thanks. Yeah. Um, you, did you at any point run your ping pong test on the A53 using a single Ethernet port? Because I'm wondering if the long tail of packets could just be that you'd get caught behind a few 1500 byte frames and that'll add hundreds of microseconds straight away. The, um, n no, I did not run it with a dedicated uh, Ethernet port. So. But I don't think, I, I, I wasn't running anything that would have large packets on the, ether. I mean, it was just SSH traffic. And so it was just terminal traffic. And it wasn't even, it was like a few bytes at a time. And so th there wouldn't have been any large packets that were causing issues, but it definitely could be congestion, not, not congestion, because it was a tiny bit of the bandwidth, but it, there could be some uh, dependencies there for the it might, the be, it might be an interesting test to run the A53 on one port and see if you get that same spread on the tail. Yeah, yeah. That, I did do that just a little bit, and um, it, the, performance, the performance wasn't as good, but um, it, it didn't have those unbounded um, tails. So for the test that you did with the uh, Zen board with the single Ethernet port, when you showed the pictures with the AE53, you were uh, using a, a dedicated cable between the two secondary Ethernet ports. Yes. For the uh, test with the A9, did you run that to a, just directly to another device and SSH from that device in addition to running the test from that device? Or were you running it through some sort of uh, hub or switch? So let me bring up What that. was on the network that had the A53, just that and the device it was round tripping with or also some like laptop you were SSHing from? Because so that could make a difference. when it was the A53 to the A9, right. everything, um, all three ports were plugged into a local uh, gigabit switch that okay. also had other, other stuff So on it there. would be interesting to try it directly from the A9 to the A53 without any switch involved, and then you could always SSH from the A53 to the A9 in order to do the test, or just set up an automated yeah. test that doesn't require so, interactivity? Yeah, th there's several other ways to do that. Um, another one is I, I have USB Ethernet ports. and I mean, dongles. that would introduce more confounding factors. I was wondering about if you could have less confounding factors right. by just having the one right. Ethernet for the so, test. Yeah, and the main reason I didn't do that is because the boot on all of these was tied to a TFTP server. I see. And so the TFTP server wants to be there, um, so it can grab that. Um, so that, that's why the, the setup was like that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, for the cyclic test measurements, you said you have used two instances of the tool with different priorities. Can Ye you please explain what's the reason for that, or if it's a usual way to do it? <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted a lot of internet traffic. Um, so the interrupt traffic um, at a lower priority seemed like a good way to kind of mimic a lot of stuff going on in so the, the, the system. So the cycle test on uh, 89 uh, priority is just some kind of stress tool in that case? The, 
let's say, I think. And not 98. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. This, this one is another stress, basically. It's another, it's another stressor for the, for the processor. And another question, uh, do we perform one long measurement with a lot of measurement points, or have you done uh, short measurements and restarted uh, multiple measurements and accumulated the results? This was just one long measurement. And if you repeat that measurement, does it depend on the starting condition of a measurement, or have you tried just one long measurement and... I've, I've done it several times. It doesn't, it doesn't vary much. Okay. It, it take, I mean, you can, it's fun to watch because you can, you can, uh, hold on, let me get that chart up here. So, you know, you can, most of the time, oh. so most of the time you don't get the highest point right away. And so you can, you can see it fill in, and then it'll like bump up one to the next microsecond bin, and then we run for another half hour, and then bumps up to the, to the next bin. And so then, but by, by you know, the end, you, it's not moving much. It's not, the, the maximum isn't moving at all. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm.